when one first comes to the Sangha, one should live in a community. Because one has to learn a lot. And by learning a lot, when one finds out about the Sangha and finds one's own place in it and what its worth is and one learns the the basis of the practice basis of the meditation practice if you start going off on your own too quickly you're likely to find either disappointment or trouble Disappoint, disappointment can come because one hasn't taken enough account of one's own kilesas. One's own kilesas are there, and when one puts on the robe, the kilesas are still there. They don't just fly away when you put on the yellow robes. And because of that, wherever one goes, one takes one's kilesas with them, with one. One takes the trouble with one, because they're inside. Because of that, you need to get the first grounding where there are other people who can keep you straight where you can test yourself against other people and in fact get rid of quite quite a number of the, the kilesas the sort of outer ones the more gross things can be got rid of there when one has done enough in the community uh, and one has learnt what's necessary, then one can go off on one's own into the forest or wherever, wherever one wants. And one can then g gain, gra gain value, but not everybody. Some people find that they go off to the forest and their mind's just wandering. They can't keep it still. They can't... Uh, get down to the practices they used to. And those people probably are not, not suited to go to the forest. Certainly not to begin with anyway. For the person who goes off to the forest, the advantages are, of course, that they can practice their own meditation without hindrance, without having to do a lot of chores and uh, duties and without having to refer to anyone else these these are quite quite valuable things for the person but uh, if they if they're not careful they can go the wrong way and they can start getting upset even angry at the difficulties in the forest because there are difficulties and if one's got the right attitude, the difficulties are a very good teacher. Uh, they're, they're one of the best teachers, in fact. I mean, you, if you meet up with wild animals, tigers and the like, then you, you, you know there that you, you're, in, you're face to face with a tiger. He can eat you up if he wants. And it's the only thing you've got on your side is Dhamma. And if you bring up the Dhamma, you'll be okay. But one's got to bring up the Dhamma and not just give way to fear. And many people give way to fear. This isn't good. And the tiger may not eat you, but it's but still it set up within you something which might cause a lot of trouble if you give way to it. The difficulty is that when fear comes up, it comes up strong, unbidden and catches you off balance sort of. and you, you don't know what to do and that fear can, can sort of take over it takes over and, and controls you a person can just sort of stand there quivering uh, and if he doesn't get back to Dhamma if he doesn't get the, the idea of Dhamma in his mind he may go mad no, no. It can cause a lot of damage. But if he's strong enough, and if he's done enough practice for the Dhamma to come up in his mind, then it can be very valuable. The overcoming of that, that fear is one of the, the major things that's necess necessary. 
Fear, as Tanishan Mahabur says, fear is an enemy which comes up in the guise, guise of a friend. It makes out that it's a friend warning you. But in fact it makes you do all the wrong things. And because of that the fear must be overcome. Going to the forest can be of great advantage. There's no doubt about it. But one shouldn't too easily go to the forest. One must remember you may have problems coming up and questions coming up. And the, the way of those who go to the forest mostly is that if they have problems they can't solve, they go back to the teacher and ask him. It may be just a visit for half an hour, an hour, and then they go back to the forest again. But one must keep in touch with the teacher. The other thing to watch out for in the forest, of course, particularly for farangs, is the effect of food. Uh, the food you get in the villages is uh, often quite insufficient and sometimes it's not even good and you might get stomach trouble, in fact many do. Uh, the putting up with stomach trouble is also a good thing to do. But health does need looking at a little bit. One mustn't just sort of blindly think that one can go on and neg neglect one's health. That's not the way of Dhamma either. The way of the of Dhamma and the, the way the teachers say is one shouldn't put oneself in difficulties unnecessarily. If one does that, one's careless. One's being careless. And carelessness is one of the things that they all say one should not develop. One should overcome. One should always be careful and watchful. And both of these things strengthen one's mindfulness. I was talking with a friend today and we were, we were talking about the nature of like one of us was under the impression that the chelases, the defilements are in the khandas and then another one of us was under the impression that the chelases are in the chitta. Mm. And, and there's a big misunderstanding about what the chitta. <laughs> it's like there's a number six on top of the five khandas No, you can see what the five khandas are, first of all. Uh, you've got the body, and that's part of the world. And that's the first khanda. It's made of the world, it's made of the substance of this world. It relies on the world, depends on it. It's completely uh, geared to the world. Every, most of the things we do depend on the, the, the body and the world. Uh, you look look round you, this building for instance, why is it this, this shape and this size? Uh, it's because of the human body. And why are the stairs like that just spread so much? Because that's the height we can step. And you, you, why do we have the lights on? Because we need light to see things, because of our eyes. If we didn't have eyes, we wouldn't need light. Uh, you look at the things all around you, where the body comes in, you find they're endless. So the body is part of the part of the world, and the other, the other khandas, the the feeling, memory, thought, and consciousness. Those four, they depend on the body. And when the body dies, they just break up and disappear. Without the body, there's no there's no no support for them. I mean. It only requires a doctor to inject some uh, anaesthetic into one's, oneself and the, the khandas, all you're left with is, is, is nothing. The, the body goes on as a function. The other khandas, as far as we know, they all cease, temporarily. And when, when one comes round again, it starts to work again. And these, these khandas, they depend on the body and there's nothing absolute about them at all. And they're not kilesas either. Because they depend on the body, 
they're they're neutral they're neutral like the body and they're they're really they're really not part of oneself fundamentally they're for our use I use the simile of a computer the body's like the hardware and uh, it's got to be there the four namakandas are like the software and the computer's no good without the software you've got to have that and the chitta is like the person who uses it and the person who uses the computer can make it do good things or bad things or, or stupid things it can, can sort of push it about all over the place and it's similar with, 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 our, our, with our kandas the chitta is the one which plays with them pushes them about it's, it's, the, it's the master of them and the, 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 the kandas are all used for the sake of the chitta or developing whatever it wants and if the chitta was pure it wouldn't matter it's, it's not it's got kilesas in it and it's the chitta with kilesas that cause all the trouble if it wasn't for the kilesas being in the chitta when the body died the kilesas would all disappear we wouldn't have any but the fact is they're in the, in the, in the chitta which doesn't die so they carry on they, they go to the next life and because of that we come back again and again like that so one must see that the, the kilesas are in the chitta, not in, not in the khandas. But the khandas take on those aspects of the kilesas which the two chittas make them take on. For instance, anger. Anger starts off in the, the chitta and then the kilesas respond with, first of all, consciousness, becoming aware of it, then the, the memory associating with whatever has produced this, then the thought processing it and making it bigger and bigger with anger, and then the, the feeling coming up. Feeling uh, comes from what one's doing, from that anger you get the feeling then, which is comes back again to the, to the chitta. These kilesas, they're the things which push, push us around all the time. The whole process of Buddha Dhamma and the whole process of developing the meditation practice is in order to get rid of these kilesas. That's, that's the prime thing. It may sort of also develop other things. Some people get psychic powers. Um, some people can sort of see the future and the past and things like that. But these are byproducts, they're not the main thing. The main thing is getting rid of those kilesa. In fact, I would say that the psychic powers and things of that sort can be a disadvantage. They can lead one astray very easily. And the person who has them or finds that they have them should be very cautious and not get caught in them. Because if one plays with them, they become sticky. It's like uh, when you play with them, you want to know what's happening somewhere. And then uh, you get get in the habit of wanting to know all the time. And one gets caught in the habit of playing with the, with the, the psychic phenomena. Then. This can be a big trap. And one should res resist it very much. After all, we've got enough powers already. If we want to fly, we can get in an aeroplane and go up. It's quite easy. And if you, if you want to uh, know what's happening at the other end of the world, well, we've got radio, television, telephones, the lot. You can quite easily do it. What's the relationship of the chitta and nibbana? The pure chitta is nibbana. The chitta that we have is the chitta that's been usurped by the kilesas. And because it's been usurped by the kilesas, it becomes a changing thing. 
in the ultimate sense you can say that Nibbana is always there uh, and that the, even the functioning of the kilesas is part of the, the, the situation but, but this, is, this is an ultimate sense an ultimate, ultimate way of looking at it and, and it doesn't mean that one mustn't work the relation of the chitta to Nibbana though is that in the normal way of things the chitta we have or our, our chitta we call it the chitta but we don't know what it is really uh, that one is so involved with kilesas that we can't see it because the chitta is not something you can see it's, it's, a, it's a function it's hard to say what it is because uh, everything we, we know in this world is impermanent changing and we only know the chet, chitta and its changingness in the way it changes all the time if you come to the pure chitta you, you, you can't know it you can't know it in the way we know things here because there's no dual, duality in that and when, there's, when there's no duality we've got no function that we can know it by except, except the chitta itself that goes rather high Yes, when consciousness arises, the chitta is the one that sort of empowers it. Uh, like if you want to make this microphone give a sound out there, it has to be empowered by sound, by speaking or whatever it is. It can't do it on its own. And Vinyana can't function on its own. Vinyana functions because the chitta makes it function. And my, my own interpretation is that the, the Vinyana is the chitta turning into dualism. So that sort of breaks into two. When it breaks into two, it's back in the world, straight away. And you get the then the the chitta and what it knows, and that's vinyana. So there must be the object side and the subject in vinyana. It, it must be dual. Um, the chitta is pure knowing without an object. Yes, you can say that. Yes, if it's a pure chitta, though, because the the kilesa chitta always has an object. <coughs> the way it functions is always there. Because of that, uh, we who got kilesas have always got kilesas, and there is always delusion. Greed or hate may be present or may not. But I, I look on greed and hate as being the two arms of delusion. They come out of delusion. Without delusion, there wouldn't be greed or hate. You can see that Avi is the starter of it. It's the thing that built it up and the uh, the delusion is always there in us it's there in us because once you get duality and it's, it's a functioning duality and it's caught up with the with the chitta then it, it, it's always there as a duality and that duality means that it's, it's delusion we can't see it we can't see what's wrong because we, we've learned things and we, we haven't questioned them properly for example when we were, we were a young child we learned things from our dad, our mum from uh, teachers from all sorts of people and we're too young to quest question them we just accepted and these things go in very deep that age they stick there and when we become adults we still have those things in us the child is still there and the child can, can comes out in fact often and it comes out mostly in, a, in an, a, an emotional mode 
it's the emotions that, that the child comes up in. in. And I mean, you can see the, the if you, if you look in yourself and other people, you see it. You see it as a child working. And all this sort of stuff that's come from childhood is riddled with delusion. We have attitudes, ideas, ways of thinking, beliefs, all sorts of things. I mean, you look at the strength of the belief in God that some religions have. They can't, they can't drop it. They're absolutely uh, caught up in it. That came from childhood. We're all mixed up. As I said yesterday, the only normal people are the Arahants. <laughs> all the rest of us are peculiar. It's true because we've got chelases. You know, the emotional residues from many people's childhood is guilt. Do you have any recommendations for people who suffer from guilt? Well, I think I said something about it last night, but never mind. So the, the the way way to deal with guilt is, is very definitely at first to accept it. Uh, also, all, the trouble is we instinctively try to resist the guilt, saying I'm not guilty, I'm perfectly all right. If you if you turn and you say all right, accept the guilt, I am guilty. And what am I guilty of? I don't know. You probably won't know what you're guilty of even. You say, well, all right, I'm guilty. What do we do now? <laughs> and you find that the whole thing starts starts to break up. You may have to do it many times, but it will break up. The important thing though, is to accept it. Because you can see that, in a sense, the guilt is there. It's, it's a valid thing. Because it's the I that's guilty, the self. And that's a delusion in the, to start with. So if one accepts the guilt there, one, if, one, if it helps to diminish that I a bit, you don't lose anything. All you're losing is a bit more delusion. Guilt is very, very common. Many people have it. But that's built up from the past. There's no doubt about it. Uh, regarding your own practice, uh, could you share uh, some of your breakthrough experiences and, and what uh, what actions or efforts appear to support those breakthroughs? <laughs> I don't like thinking about my own practice. <laughs> No, one can't talk much about that, really. <laughs> I mean, some things you, you can't explain, anyway. And some things you don't know why they come about. I mean, one gets, by, by practice and development, one gets a sense of certainty, a sense of knowing, knowing where, where one's going, although one hasn't, hasn't actually got there. But this is a sense you can't describe it, you just got to do it. <laughs> That's all. The, the really important things that happened in practice though, it's no good talking to, to people about it and telling them. Because uh, it doesn't mean it wouldn't mean anything. It doesn't mean any, anything to someone who hasn't got the experience. It's like Janachan Mahabur says, he doesn't like talking about jhana to somebody who doesn't know what jhana is, who hasn't experienced it. And there's a lot of talk about jhana, and there's a lot of people who have got an idea what it is, and it's all wrong. Tanachan has said that the person who has the characteristics of jhana inherently in them and it's in their kamma must go that way. Other people should, shouldn't, shouldn't try it. 
One shouldn't try and develop jhana if it's not in one's character. One should develop samadhi. That's enough. But the difference between jhana and samadhi, Tanachan didn't state. He didn't didn't say. Or he says it's different. And he says if you if you don't know what it is, then keep to samadhi. is very essential. Tanachan said when he was learning, when he was practicing to begin with, he used the, the Parikama Buddha. He used that, the repetition of Buddha internally. And he, he had done this for quite a long time. And he said his practice developed, and then it deteriorated. And it developed again, and it deteriorated. Constantly was doing this. In the end, he got fed up with this, and he said, "the The only thing I must do is, what I what I'm going to do is, I'm going to keep on with that Buddha and not stop for anything. The only time I stop is when I go to sleep." This is what he did, and he did that. And after a time, the results came. He got into samadhi. And th- this is the this is the value of a parikama. You must have something to hold on to. Otherwise, the mind just jumps to other things, and it's not good to to jump from one parikama to another if you find this one doesn't work, because nearly always, if you do that, you will find that the first parikama goes up to a certain point, then you get a block. You can't go further. You must got to overcome that, and the way is really just to keep on with the one parikama, and that's it. One shouldn't be changing parikamas uh, often. If you if you if you feel after some time that you can't get on with one, or you can't find it doesn't work, all right, change. But don't change uh, just because it becomes a bit difficult. Like the bread. So when during the day, would they usual common? Is it to um, have a mantra as well to make it more easier to watch during the day? Or what's the usual? You can use that. You can use like uh, like Buddha and the breathing. Uh, if you put the two together, that's all right. Yes. In in the ways of Karmatana, uh Incidentally, the word kamatana, some of you may not know what it means. Kamatana is, is the Pali word kamma, which means action, and tana, which means a basis. So it's a basis for action, a basis for for practice, in other words. It, it means that not only the practice of meditation, but also the, the practice of training oneself in all sorts of other ways. Uh, the sort of training you do uh, based on a winya is, is part of it. And the training you do by learning to get on with other people. As, well, in Thai it's called samag, or samagi, samagi in Pali I think also. It's the, it's the getting together with other people and the doing things with other people and not always just wanting to do it on one's own. And th- these are these are a great help. The, all these sort of things are a great help. The the external things as, as well as the, the the meditation practice. In fact, one one can overcome many kilesas, gross kilesas, by practical things that one does outside. You know, if somebody says. Oh, you go and do that. Well, the tendency is to say, why the hell do you pick on me? Uh, <laughs> but the person who's training themselves and who's thought about it and said, yeah, the, 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 the uh, dissension comes up in me, 
but I'm going to do it because I'm practicing. And I go and do it. And this is the way to overcome a lot of the kilesas. But the parikamma is the is important, very important. And if you really want to get into the samadhi practice, the way way to do it best is to keep it going the whole time. You keep the breathing going when with whatever you do. After all, whatever you do, your breathing is going to going to be there anyway. You're not going to hold your breath all day long. It's got to be there. And the thing is just being aware of it. And the, the, the way of being aware of it is not necessarily trying to be very one-pointed or very concentrated on it, but it's just being mindful of it. After all, it is called anapanasati. It's got sati at the end there. So it's the mindfulness of breathing, which means you just have that awareness of the breath all the time, even though you're doing other things. Yes, yes, certainly. After all, when you're sweeping and doing manual labor, it's quite easy to be thinking about other things. It's quite easy to be thinking about your home or your uh, interests or whatever it is. Why not think about the breathing <laughs> instead? It's yeah, actually talking about thinking of the breathing is wrong. It's not thinking about it, it's just awareness of it. And I, th I think if you do that, when you're aware of the breathing, you'll find your awareness tends to be in, on other things and on your sweeping or whatever you're doing also. Yes. So and so in the Panya develops Samadhi, would that still take up a Parakama in the day? Yes, you can have a Panya Parakama. There are such things. But Panya Pram Samadhi uh, is for those people who, whose mind becomes very interested in in thinking thinking about things and sort of seeing how they work and you, you, you think about your own body and bits and pieces and see how it works and if you can do that, that can lead to samadhi it can lead to samadhi by what happens is the, the interest in the thinking uh, starts to concentrate the mind as it concentrates the mind you get the, the factors of Piti and Sukha coming up and it goes into Samadhi it's like any work if you do it uh, and you, you do it for some time uh, it's quite likely to become interesting when it becomes interesting yeah, it becomes rather intriguing and then because of that you want to do it and you go on doing it and that can lead to Samadhi But if a person finds too much distraction, the mind won't stick on anything, then they must do, use the samadhi develops pan, panya. Let's use the normal method. Yes. But did I understand you correctly? You, uh, last time, did you say that it's possible to have uh, a found realization and not be aware of it? No. It's possible to have profound realizations and not to know what they are. Uh, like something happens, or you see bright lights or something coming up, and uh, one feels good inside, and so on. Um, then you you look at that and you say, well, I know that there were bright lights there, and I know what I heard, I know what I felt. Uh, uh, but I don't know what it was. It's quite possible. I mean, should you call it samadhi? Should you call it jhana? Should you call it uh, stream entry? You don't know. Because one hasn't got the 
the experience of that. One's never experienced it before, something new, and one doesn't know what words to put to it. Because the experience is like actually walking the path or walking the road. Whereas the the ideas you have are the map. And often you can't recognize the road from the map. If someone does has does experience uh, seemingly profound insight, would you just recommend uh, not putting a label on it and just keep on with the practice? Yes, very definitely, yes. yes. Putting labels on it is dangerous. Because uh, uh, putting labels on it, the person thinks, oh, I'm so dark and now and put up my stars here. <laughs> <laughs> and that can be a big hindrance. <laughs> also, a person can develop conceit on that too. <laughs> Speak a little bit more on that, on conceit, um, when there's success in practice. Conceit is important. It's a factor of greed. You know, conceit is the promotion of self. It's the making out that self is good. Self is maybe better than other people. Self is all oh, very pure, very straight. It's these sort of ideas. The main trouble with it is, though, when you do that, you build up self higher and higher and higher. And when it comes down, it hurts. As it surely will. Because uh, it's it's like the the fall of the the two towers in America. And you can see you see there the sort of in the analogy of conceit where they 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 all thought the wonderful things and then bang they're gone and they didn't like it at all. Can't blame them, but I mean the the thing is this is the way conceit works. The conceit comes about by thought, and the thoughts with conceit. Uh, things that one must look at often and realize what they are and the best thing is when you have thoughts of conceit quickly turn around and find the opposite in oneself shouldn't be too difficult see where one's got plenty of kilesas too when you put a bit of balance on it then when one is investigating thoughts, thinking process, how much attention should one give to the, the content of thinking? Or should one rather attend to the specific facts of like it's arising or vanishing? The content of thinking is important because by the content of thinking, the attitude changes. When one thinks of something, it, one takes on up the emotional attitude associated with that. This is why when you say parikamma, you use the word buddho, buddho. Not, not, not some other word which is, is meaningless or, or, or bad, or has bad connotations. Now it's quite important the, the, the connotation of what, what uh, one thinks about. But if thoughts, bad thoughts come up, even though you don't want them, then all right, if they come up on their own, let them come up, but look at them. Look at what they are. If you, one mustn't try just the, the, the suppression of thought like that. That has a bad effect. Uh, but it only has a bad effect if, you, if they're very strong thoughts, if they come up strongly. And some people, they get thoughts coming up, like that. Very funny bit in the book. A psychiatrist who was working in a mental hospital. And there was one patient in the hospital, an old Scotsman. And he's saying all the time, all the time he's talking like, get away from me, you filthy people. Get away. Don't tell me these things. I don't want to hear them. <laughs> he was going on like that swearing and sort of with very bad language and uh, so the the doctors were consulted together what should they do they thought oh we, we better give him a, 
uh, leukotomy. That's when they put the needles in and mess the brain up there. So they did this. <laughs> Afterwards, uh, he he said, uh, "Oh, speak up, speak up! I can't hear you. <laughs> Where are you? I can't hear you now." And he, the 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 doctor thought, "Oh, it's an improvement." Yes. There you're getting somebody who really, the thoughts coming out, they couldn't stop them. Thoughts, and I mean, he obviously had the full belief that there was somebody telling him these things. Not realizing it's coming from his own chelators all the time. <laughs> One must not, not underrate the potential of the mind to produce strange phenomena. Anybody who's read anything about the the uh, phenomena in, for example, schizophrenia and uh, other psychic phenomena will realize that the mind can produce almost anything with great strength. So one must be cautious, very cautious, when anything arises like sound, like people talking to you. Because the the chitta is quite capable, the chitta with kilesa is quite capable of creating this. The other thing, of course, is if you do get voices coming up, don't do what they say unless it's absolutely reasonable. You must conform to reason. And I must think about it and see whether it's reasonable or not. If it's reasonable, all right, it doesn't matter. But if it's if it's uh, something bizarre, we they would never do it. Yes, that's all right. Yeah. I, I would interpret that to mean that when when any any object comes up in mind, you you don't grasp. The sign of it usually means the the uh, memory content associated with it. In other words, that triggers off memory. And be, that would be the sign. The content of it will depend on what it is. Presume that the content is probably some either something that has meaning, like speech or a visible written word or something that's a symbol, symbolic content and one, one merely notes these things without grabbing hold of them because if you grasp they take the mind away straight away it's like, like when you start doing the, the meditation practice the, uh, whether it's Anapana or the Buddha practice, or almost any other, uh, you get memories coming up. And they bring up thoughts, objects, all sorts of things. And when these memories come up, one's natural tendency is to think, what's that? And one grasps it. And that is tanha. One wants to know. It's wanting. And the, the correct thing to do there is, is to have mindfulness, to be aware of this, and to see the danger that this is pulling me away from the meditation practice. And to then say, I'm not interested in this. This isn't my, what I'm doing. I don't want these thoughts. I'm not going to think of them. But to to do that often requires some training. One has to sort of reflect time after time when one gives way and forgets. A bit by bit one can get it, one can, get, can bring it up so that it, it comes up immediately. It's like a red flag comes up inside. Uh, warning, this is dangerous. Probably the meaning is that when a person detains our hand, Tanachan has said like this, he's explained it. When a person attains Arahant, 
the jitter goes quiet. Jitter is inside, and that's unmoving. But the five candles are still there, and they're going to act. And they're going to act much in the way they did before. Except that there won't be any fire there. The fire will have gone. The the uh, chilesas have gone, in other words. The state of an arahant is. The, the, the five khandas are there, still. But, but the, the chilesas have gone, have gone, well, they've, they've disappeared. There are no, no, no chilesas left. Because there are no chilesas left, the five khandas don't do wrong things. And in that state, uh, there is no kamma. Kamma is not produced. What is what is done, they say, is what they call kriya, which means mere action. And that doesn't make kamma. Technically, as I understand it, in the normal person, you've got the bhavanga chitta and the, the uh, moments of bhavanga link one with another. Because of that, there's the idea of time comes up, the idea of continuity. With the arahant, that's broken, and so there's no, the continuity uh, isn't inherently there. And because of that, the tendency is for any action to be just that action, and it doesn't doesn't follow on. There's no, it doesn't sort of go on, to, on into a train of things like most people. But don't worry too much about being, being an arahant. Because <laughs> <laughs> things must change a lot before that, I think. <laughs> Yes, certainly. But the sense restraint of a Petujana with the ordinary person is something that they have to do. They have to recognize it and not let go. But fundamentally, we've always got that choice there, and that is the choice of the chitta, to do it or not to do it. Appreciation of acceptance, the practice of appreciation of acceptance, not enough. Appreciation of of everything. Of everything. <laughs> the appreciation of everything is also putting an attitude onto everything, views, and the tendency there will be for the mind to go far and wide. And what one has to ask is, who is doing the appreciation? Who and what? And one will find, if one looks at the khandas, that the appreciation there uh, will be basically thinking probably about the world. And although the thoughts may not be particularly harmful, it's still not the, not the way. I can have appreciation, certainly. There's nothing wrong in that. But it's not not enough on its own. It's difficult to understand what's necessary. We, we're trying for Nibbana. And fundamentally, for Nibbana, in the end, one has got to give up everything. Everything without exception. Because anything that's left will pull you back. In other words, Nibbāna is the state of non-dualism. It's a complete purity. It's emptiness, meaning empty of the world. Now, if you have anything there at all, it'll keep you back, it'll prevent you getting there. It's like the person who's done a lot of practice and they, they find that everything's empty, everything's gone and they still can't get there and they go to the teacher and ask him what, what's wrong, why, should, why shouldn't I get it to Nibbana by this and they say well 
you're still there. While he's still there, he won't do it, he won't go. If he gets out of it, out of the way, if the self gets out of the way, okay, there's... there's <laughs> I mean, in that case, you can say, the self is wanting Nibbana. While the self is wanting Nibbana, it can't get Nibbana. When it stops, gives up, and that, there it is, as it should be. In fact, as it always was. Don't think Nibbana is far away. It's not. Nibbana is there in oneself always. Tantra Mahabur once described it, it's like as though it's, it's within you, but it's wrapped.